What's up ladies and gents and welcome to Age of Empires Definitive Edition. We are here with a civilization overview and the first civilization we are going to look at is the first in this list, the Assyrians. In this overview we are going to first look at the technology tree, which you can already see here. Then we are going to look at some examples in action of the things we notice in the technology tree. And in the last part we are going to look at where we can find the Assyrians in the campaign. So here we are with the technology tree and the first thing you can see is the Assyrians actually only get two civilization bonuses. And that's the least of any civilization in the game. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they are the worst. Obviously, the bonus itself is what makes the difference, not how many of them you get. But something to know, they only get two. Every other civilization gets at least three, some get four, and one gets five. Which one that is? We'll find that out at a later point. Now, let's look at the first one and with that in turn at their economy. Here we have villagers move 10% faster. Now that is a bonus for the economy that is really felt the moment you start the game. Because it applies to everything. Whether you walk to somewhere where you want to build a building, whether it is a house, a military building, a drop-off point, whatever it is, when you walk there to build it, you move there faster, you arrive faster, which means you finish it faster. Also, it applies to walking to the drop-off points. So when you work on a farm, you walk to the TC or wherever you want to drop it off, you do that faster. You chop trees, walk back, you do that faster. You mine gold, walk back, you do that faster. So it applies to every sort of resource that you gather. So this is felt right from the start and completely disregarding whichever strategy you go for, whether you need a lot of food, a lot of wood, whatever it is, it applies to everything. And it is a bonus that is felt throughout the game from start to finish. So let's look at the rest of the economy, because that alone doesn't already mean they have a good economy. If they, for example, miss a lot of upgrades, then that kind of negates the bonus. And oftentimes in Age of Empires we see when someone has a bonus like that, then some of the later upgrades are missing to kind of negate that in the super late game. But as we go towards the right and we see the market, all economy upgrades. That's wonderful news for the Assyrians. Because not only do you get that bonus that applies to basically all the resources, you also get all the upgrades to gather the resources faster. So all in all, a very, very solid economy for the Assyrians. And like I already hinted at, at the start, we will see what kind of difference that makes in the actual game when we do a little bit of practical testing later on in the second part of the video. So here we are with the second bonus that we see on the side. Archers fire 25% faster. And let me tell you right now that is a lot. 25% is a great bonus. So that would probably imply well the Assyrians were great archers if and they probably have all the archers available to them and you go archers all the game. But when we look at the archery range and we're kind of confused because there's a lot missing. No improved bowmen, no composite bowmen obviously as a result of that. No heavy horse archers, no elephant archers. And let me start by saying this. If they had elephant archers or heavy horse archers, oh my god. <laughs> um, there's a reason why they don't have that. An elephant archer with 25% faster firing would be insane. So let's look at the archers they do have. Obviously that bonus doesn't come into play in the Stone Age because the only military unit in the Stone Age is the Clubman, which isn't very good. So that bonus only applies starting with the Tool Age. But again, that's really where the military part comes into play, so 
that's all right. So in the tool age, we have bowmen, which fire 25% faster. So in a tool age fight, you obviously only have a very limited amount of units available in general, the X-Men, the Slinger for other civilizations, the Scout and the Bowman. And your stronger Bowman are a really, really good choice. So once we go into the Bronze Age, we see we have the Chariot Archer. Now the Chariot Archer is, well, it's better than an improved Bowman. Obviously, if we compare that, we have 70 hit points, 4 attack, and 7 range. And here we have 40 hit points, 4 attack, and 6 range. Obviously, it's a lot more expensive at 40 food and 70 wood. And here we have 40 food and 20 gold. But at least it doesn't cost gold. So even in the late stage of the game, when the gold is running out and you're kind of fighting a trash fight, you still have strong chariot archers. Now this ties into another sort of problem the Assyrians have, however, because their chariot archers are obviously horse units. I mean, they're using a horse, right? So the upgrade that applies to them is this one, nobility. They don't get that. So even though their horse archers fire faster, or their chariot archers, I'm sorry, they fire faster, they lack the extra HP. Then obviously we don't get the improved and composite bowmen, but that's not too big of a deal if you have chariot archers. And then we look at the Iron Age. Now obviously once we reach the Iron Age we can go into horse archers if we want to get rid of the chariot archers. And obviously horse archers if you compare Yes, we have 10 less HP, but we have three more attack, we have one pierce armor, and we have the same range. So obviously horse archers are the better unit. However, they also cost more resources. And they actually cost a lot of gold. But luckily, we haven't been spending a lot of gold on archers in the Bronze Age because we've been using chariot archers and not improved bowmen. So... What about the horse archers then? Well, let's look at the Iron Age. Obviously the horse archer beats any other regular horse archer because it fires faster. But again, we are missing some things because obviously the lack of nobility affects our horse archer as well. And we lack alchemy, which is increased damage. So not only do we not get the extra HP, we also don't get the extra damage which also, if we're looping back, affects the Chariot Archer in the super late game where we use it as kind of a trash unit. We do not get the Heavy Horse Archer, which is kind of a bummer, but it's very expensive and this really only affects the super late game. And like we already hinted at, we do not get the Elephant Archer. So all in all, what we can see is their bonus applies to these three units and they are really especially for the part of the game until the early Iron Age very capable go-to units. So we will see how that all plays out in action in the second part of the video like I already hinted at but let's look at the other parts of the technology tree now. So here we are with the rest of the technology tree and I think here it pays to just start at the left, work our way to the right. And at the left we see the barracks. Now what we can see with the barracks is we have the full swordsman line, which is good. We do not have a slinger, which is not ideal. We do have the axeman, which is useful in the tool age, but we're probably going for bowmen anyway. So, are their barracks units any good? Now, obviously, we do get up to legion, and legions by themselves are already very good. So, let's look at the upgrades they get. We see here they get full attack upgrades, they get full defense upgrades, but oh wait, they don't get really full defense upgrades because we don't get the shield upgrades. Obviously, a great counter to infantry is ranged units, 
And normally what we need against ranged units is defense against missile weapons. We don't get that. And that's a shame. So that really is a problem for their infantry. It's very easily countered by ranged units, which is already a thing, but it just gets worse for the Assyrians. It's good to know, however, that you can at least go for long swordsmen if you need some infantry, because the upgrades for long swordsmen they are reasonably priced. Whether legion are worth it is a bit of a discussion maybe for another date because their upgrade cost is very high and you probably won't focus on using legions anyway so it kind of depends on what the enemy is using obviously and what if they are but their infantry while you have the versatility to go into them is not kind of any sort of top notch So if we go towards the right, we see the archery range, which we kind of already covered. So we move over to the siege workshop. Now here we see another goodie, namely we have all the units available. The helepolis, the heavy catapult, everything available. Now that in itself is already great, great news. So let's look at the upgrades for the siege units and how well equipped they are. We obviously have to move over here and like with our ranged units in the archery range we also see here we don't get alchemy. Luckily however neither the heavy catapult nor the helepolis is really dependent on alchemy. They do so much damage that a little bit extra doesn't make that big of a difference. They do however get engineering which is really the big upgrade that they need, namely plus two siege weapon range. And for the Helepolis they get ballistics. So that's really the two major upgrades if you want to go for these siege units and they do get those. So they have a very very strong siege lineup. So next up we have the stable and what we can see here right off the bat is we do get cataphracts. But unfortunately, we don't get any elephants and we don't get scythe chariots, which are pretty much the ultimate trash weapon along with a chariot archer. So that kind of limits our trash capabilities a little bit, but we still get the regular chariot. And we also get the Camel Rider. So in the Bronze Age we get the full lineup. It's really only in the Iron Age where we start missing some of the units. Now are they really worth using? You do at least get a full storage pit, all the defense and attack upgrades. But the lack of nobility means they do fall behind some cavalry civilizations. So while they are useful in a pinch, using them as your go-to unit means they, have, they lack a little bit of that extra muscle that other cavalry civilizations get. So they do here add the variety because you have the option, but again lacking a little bit of that extra punch, a little bit of that extra durability, and that also makes them easier to counter. And obviously we also lack nobility on these units, but we have nothing offsetting for the stable like we do here with a 25% faster firing. So the stable, pretty good, nothing special. So next we see the academy and, uh, well, no. Just no. I mean, look at this. We're lacking phalanx, we're lacking centurion. And even if you kind of feel the need to grab hoplites in the Bronze Age, well, maybe in a pinch, if they're kind of useful in the very specific situation you might find yourself in. But generally speaking, no. No. <laughs> I mean, you lack Bronze Shields, so they're even easier to counter with ranged units. And you also 
once you do get to the Iron Age, lag aristocracy, which means your academy units won't even be able to move faster. So the hoplites will forever stay Bronze Age slow. So they're just not any good. Like really, maybe there is some weird situation where it makes sense, but generally speaking, no. So the next thing we can look at is here the granary with the defensive buildings. And what we can see here is we have everything. We have fortified walls, we get ballista towers, everything here. Now, there is a drawback to that, as with most things in the Assyrian tech tree. And the drawback to this is we are lacking architecture, which means we do not get the same hit points as some other specialized civilizations that get great defensive buildings. Now with the walls, I don't really care. Kind of use them in a pension where we have a little bit extra HP. It can help at times, but it's not that important. With the towers, it's a little bit annoying and also the less built time that isn't available kind of hurts when you want to push with towers. And to compound the entire thing, we lack alchemy, which matters a lot more for a tower with 20 attack, even though it's still not that big of a deal than it does for the siege weapons, but we're fine. They have fine defensive buildings and they can use them. So now we will take a short glance over the government center. We have pretty much covered everything here. We do get ballistics and engineering, which is important. We lack alchemy and aristocracy. I mean, we probably don't go for academy units anyway, so that one doesn't matter too much. Alchemy is a bit of a bummer. Missing architecture ties into the defensive building thing, which is not ideal, but okay. And missing nobility is a little bit annoying because of the horse archers and the chariots. Logistics, meanwhile, is kind of useful when you go for a lot of barracks units. And as we already established, their barracks units are usable, but nothing special. So then we have the temple. And as you can already see, that is a strong point of the Assyrians because they get everything. A full temple, all the attacks, and to make it even better, we probably won't use very much gold in the Bronze Age because we can go for the Chariot Archer, so we might have some gold left over to spend on some priests. So priests and temple in general, very strong point for the Assyrians, definitely consider using them. And the last point we have in the tech tree is the duck. And as you can see, it's almost a full duck. We are missing the catapult trireme and the juggernaut, which admittedly is quite annoying. And another point we have to mention is that our triremes and fire galleys are missing. Where is it? Alchemy. Which, if it gets to the late game, once again is annoying. So missing alchemy really affects a lot of things. So overall a solid duck, but not a great one. So here we are with a more practical side and what we can see first is a really good benefit of the 10% faster movement and that is, as we can see now, our villager is actually faster than an X-Man. Now later in the game, the villagers are pretty fast anyway, once you get wheel. But here, especially early on when you're being raided, being able to outrun an X-Man, like we can see here, we are just marginally faster, is a great benefit. If we compare that to say, a regular villager here against an X-Man. And we test that. Then we can see the X-Man is actually a lot faster and can raid us a lot more effectively. So that is actually a great, great benefit. 
Now, as we watch this race, I will actually just read out the benefits of the eco because the eco benefits aren't really interesting to look at. I mean, you just look at a villager chop something. So I did five minute testing with one villager and I did it with fully upgraded Assyrian villagers against fully upgraded chosen villagers. And what I found was when we are cutting wood from one tile away, we only get a free wood difference. Now we place the, the drop off point one tile away and we only get a free wood difference in five minutes of wood cutting, which is really marginal. Even when you extend it to 10 villagers, we'd have 30. And even if we extend it to 50 minutes and 10 villagers, we'd just have 300 wood difference and that's for that long of a time frame really marginal and even when we have five tiles away so that's really a big difference i mean it's five times as much to walk and five tiles away for a drop off point is actually pretty far and then it's still only four wood difference and I did several tests, sometimes it was five wood, sometimes it was four wood difference. So there is a difference there, but it's so marginal over time that it really wasn't that important. Now, when you are farming right next to a granary or right next to your town center, you actually have zero difference, like literally nothing, because the villagers don't actually walk on the farms they just hark in their farm and when they drop off and in the scenario where you have a farm right next to the drop-off point which is the ideal scenario anyway you don't get any walking time so there's no difference but even when you are one farm away there was only a one to two food difference so when you have two layers of farms even then the difference was very marginal so that now sounds like a bit of a bummer but you must consider these differences of a little bit extra go on for the entire game and for all the resources unless you are like right next to them but it's for gold it's for stone it's for wood it's for food when you are a little bit away you get that a little bit extra obviously the bonus can't make as much of a difference as the resource bonuses of other civilizations where they get a huge bonus on either food or wood or gold or whatever it is because it works for all the resources and it works for getting faster and being able to outrun the axemen as we saw there so that's really the benefit of the 10 percent faster movement summed up in just a few words and what we will look at next is the archer bonus so here we are with the archer testing and what we will look at first is a straight up 1v1 bowman fight because that is where the archer bonus really shines in the early game and what we can see we survive with 8 hit points and this is relatively consistent I did 20 tests on this we always survive with 8 hit points which makes sense when you consider we are firing 25% faster we got the hits in 25% quicker to kill him so we survived with roughly 25% of our health it all adds up it all makes sense but it actually is a lot clearer on how big that bonus actually is if we are looking at 10 bowmen versus 10 bowmen stacked up against another when we are doing the, the testing here now these ones run away to their max distance for one to two seconds but even when you place them a bit further back you still get the same result of five to six bowmen so i'm obviously this one very badly damaged so you might lose this one you might not i always had five to six left and that was really the, the average outcome of 20 tests on this 
So the next unit we are looking at is the Chariot Archers and we have a simple 1v1 again as our starting test and what we can see here is the Chariot Archers firing at one another. Again we have this one retreating but the outcome didn't really change whether I moved him back or forth. We survive with 18 of 70 HP which is roughly the result we were already expecting from a math perspective. Nothing interesting to see here. However, when we now go to the next, namely 10 Chariot Archers, this is all without upgrades by the way, and we test them against one another. then we can see a relatively similar result to when we did the bowman test which is expected i mean we have the same units like us and the enemy we have the same exact units and we have a 25 percent faster firing speed so we expect this test to give roughly the same as the bowman test and as you can see we do get roughly the same result we have that one badly damaged unit and five fairly healthy ones which is again exactly what we expected here and that really shows the true power of this 25 percent faster firing speed if you enter a fight with the same amount of resources spent with the same amount of units and the same upgrades and you come out with five to six units remaining which is like half your army still alive So the next test we are running here is against a unit that has nobility. Now that was the first upgrade we were looking at that we were missing and nobility gives the horse units more HP. So let's look at this. Obviously they have 80 HP, we have 70. So you might be wondering, are we still winning? Now we were surviving our regular test with 18 HP left and might think well now we survive with 8 and oh, we survive with 14 sometimes 10 it kind of depends on who gets the first shot off but we still comfortably survive and again this was all a math question and if you do the math on how many hits you need to take in versus so many you get that's exactly what we would have expected if we however now do a 10v10 with nobility we obviously would expect a different outcome than the six surviving ones but as you can see nope still six surviving ones the difference is so marginal of nobility that you still have five to six left sometimes it was five this one died and the other survived you lose a little bit more hp in total but generally speaking the difference really is very very marginal and once the first ones die here it they just get steamrolled so very very marginal difference that nobility makes in the chariot archer fights yes their units are a little bit more durable but you're still coming out ahead if you do a nobility fight versus no nobility so yeah next up what we will test is the last unit we are going to test namely the horse archers and obviously if we are on same upgrades the result is as expected we are easily winning with roughly 18 hp left sometimes we take a hit more due to the upper unit getting the first hit in but generally speaking this is what we were expecting this is what we are getting nothing particularly interesting now however what happens if we have a horse archer with full upgrades and by full upgrades i mean alchemy and nobility and for that we will look at this test where our place at maximum range i think to mitigate the running away 
So as you can see here, we have seven plus one attack. We only get seven. And we get a tie. Now you're probably wondering, well, what if we do a 10v10? I tried doing that, but the enemy AI was so stupid that we always came out on top because it was just running away and kiting and doing whatever and it just didn't work very well. Um, but yeah, if you do a 1v1 here, you actually get a tie. So that means your horse archers are actually competitive against fully upgraded ones, even though your stats are much worse. So that really shows the true power of 25% faster firing and that you can just keep up with anyone until fully upgraded horse archers. Now, since you tie a regular fully upgraded horse archer, what you don't want to do is fight heavy horse archers. But I think that one is pretty obvious. So that kind of sums up the archer bonus, I hope. It was kind of informative on how you perform against archers of other civilizations in different scenarios and numbers. And lastly, we are going to look at where the Assyrians can be found in the campaign, and we will do that now. So here we are in the campaigns, and for a little bit of context, the Assyrians were located roughly between Babylon and the Hittite Empire which is somewhat northeast of the Egyptian region. And they did not have a border with Egypt, which is part of the reason why the Assyrians do not appear in the Egyptian campaign. They also do not appear in the Greek campaign. However, like I just said, they are between the Hittites and Babylon. So the Babylon campaign is actually where they are featured most in six of the eight missions, in fact, representing nine of the enemy AI players. And they're mostly representing the Elamites there. Next up is the Yamato campaign, where they once again do not appear. However, they do appear in the Hittite campaign, namely in the first two missions, opening moves, and raid on Babylon. They represent three of the AI players there. In the Rise of Rome, they are present once in the Battle of Zama. Now the Assyrians weren't actually at the Battle of Zama, but they were chosen as the Civ. We can just quickly jump here to showcase this. They were chosen as the Civ to represent the Numidians. And I think that was chosen because the units the Assyrians have on offer were just used as something representing the Numidians pretty well, because obviously the Numidians don't have their own Civ in the game. So I think that's why they were picked there. And for a very similar reason, in the Ab Caesar campaign, they are actually present in a mission, Just namely in the Siege you. of Alicia. We can see the three Gallic armies right here, all are Assyrian. Now, obviously, that makes no sense Your whatsoever. Failure. They were obviously not Assyrians. But again, there are no Gauls or no Gallic armies as a civilization. So probably for the reason of being the right sieve to balance this, they were just picked for that mission. And that's also the last time they appear. So they are prominently featured in the Babylon and the Hittite campaign and have two very odd appearances in the Roman campaigns. But Imperium Romanum, Enemies of Rome and First Punic War all do not feature the Assyrian sieve. Unfortunately, we do not play it even once in the campaigns. They only appear as enemies, again most prominently featured in the Babylon campaign representing the Alamites. So yeah, that's where they appear in the campaigns. I hope you got a nice overview of the Assyrian Civ, their tech tree, what their bonuses mean in practice, and where they appear in the campaign. I hope this gives you a little bit of a 
better picture when you play them the next time or when you just want to play against them in a campaign. Unfortunately, again, you can't play as the Assyrians, but we might have better luck next time with the next Sith we will cover. So, yeah, again, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope this helps you out learning the Assyrian Sith a little bit better. And until next time with the next civilization, farewell.